So our next speaker is Robert Nichols, good friend of mine, on talking about a favorite topic of mine. Somewhere like okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honour to be here presenting. And um, I want to talk really. I've been thinking about this issue of deltas as coupled social ecological systems. I want to really take one project we've done. We've done a number of projects at Southampton on these kind of issues. Two big ones. One's active. I'm going to look at the ESPA Deltas project, which we've, uh, which is still ongoing in a way, as I'll explain, but most of the work has sort of been done, and it's done a lot of work about bringing together the natural and the human world in Bangladesh. So it sort of, I think, sets a nice context for the theme of, of this meeting. Um, to give you a sort of plan, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, deltas, um, then look a little bit at some of the components we need to consider if we're going to sort of talk about coastal Bangladesh. Then the issue of integration. So this thing, delta DM, will be mentioned a number of times, the Delta Dynamic Integrated Emulator Model, which is a framework for doing integration. I'll show you some results and then a few concluding remarks. And if we just start with deltas, well, I mean, I think probably most of you would recognize the Nile Delta without a title. And um, you can see the strong kind of contrast between the desert, um, the, 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 the unvegetated desert, and the very vegetated delta. And it brings home the point that deltas really um, concentrate ecosystem services. They're extraordinarily fertile places in the mid and low latitudes. Uh, and 70% you know, of people, the world's population lives on them. And the key thing, I think, is that they can support more than 500 people per square kilometer. In Bangladesh, it's more than 1,000 people per square kilometer living off the land. Tremendous sort of um, productivity. And this is a picture we produced back in 2010 when we sort of started this work, trying to illustrate the ecosystem services that are ongoing um, in, uh, in the, in the Gangemar Pukra Delta. And, um, you know, they were, they're diverse um, but, but in terms of provisioning large amounts of food and, and, and water, et cetera, that can support the population. And the question, of course, is with deltas under um, significant uh, drivers of change, how will these evolve into the future? Then ESPA, I've mentioned this ESPA Deltas project, and I think it's important just to mention ESPA so it finds a context. It was a 40 million, well it is, because it's still active, 40 million pound program looking at um, ecosystem services for poverty alleviation. So it's coming out of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment um, and looking at this relationship between ecosystem services and, and poverty alleviation or human well-being. And so it was very explicitly uh, transdisciplinary. And our project, ESPA Deltas, you know, or formerly Assessing Health, Livelihoods, Ed Ed Ecosystem Services, and Poverty Alleviation in Populous Deltas, was the largest of these um, grants supported. Went from 2012 to 2016. And we worked in um, coastal Bangladesh. And we actually do, we are actually continuing it um, at the present time with the government of Bangladesh in terms of applying it to look at some sort of public policy um, aspects. When we, a call came out, and it was sort of interesting, where in the, where in the coast are there ecosystem services? And it took about two seconds to think deltas and the rest, is sort of, the rest is history. Our study site, again, you probably all know this pretty well, but um, so you know, we, we've, got, got the get, we've got the delta sitting here, the hatched area. We've got the, the catchment sitting above, draining the highest mountains on Earth. You must also remember the Bay of Bengal, because fisheries are very important uh, in the study sites. And we're actually not studying the whole delta. What we call, what we're studying is coastal Bangladesh, which is uh, this area here, including the Bangladesh portion of Sundarbans, the cities of Kulna and Barasel, an area with a population of 14 million people. Studying this was a very multidisciplinary problem, and it took a lot of people. So this is just acknowledging um, that the consortium that, uh, led, that led this, that contributed to this project with seven UK partners, 12 Bangladeshi partners, two partners in India, and this is one of our, our, our consortium meetings uh, in Bangladesh in 2014. And then we had um, this strategic partner, which we developed through the project, which is the planning commission in the government of Bangladesh, which, which is, again, built in that we were, would engage with the government 
uh, and what developed was this distinct relationship with Canning Commission over the life of the church. What was the idea? We had a sort of vision from the very beginning that was very integrative, and we wanted to really allow policymakers to sort of um, use information over this large spatial scale to think about ecosystem services and people's livelihoods. We might say in plain English, link science to policy at the landscape scale, at this sort of at this very large spatial domain. And how would it make a difference to the poor? The money for ESPA, I should have said, is coming largely from GIFID, so it's essentially like USAID. Um, so it's, it's very much linked to development. So our pathway to impact, which you have to have when you're doing development, was to develop methods that would, would inform the national government so they could make better decisions across this landscape. So that was, that was our pathway um, to impact. When you start to think about the different scales that are going on, I've already hinted at some of the different scales that are, that, that are there with the, with the map, but we've got to think about global scales, things like obviously climate change. Bangladesh is obviously the poster child for the impacts of sea level rise. Um, but we must also consider regional and, and, and river delta scales. Um, there's lots of changes, such as dams. Um, also, Dhaka. I mean, Dhaka was 250,000 people in 1950. It's now 20 million people. It's not in our study area, but it's having a huge effect um, on, the, on the country and, and uh, on the delta. So it gets quite complicated when you start to think through all the different things uh, that are going on. So in terms of our approach, we wanted to look at both, we wanted to understand the present day um, situation and then prognosis, be able to think a little bit about the future um, of these, uh, these, these issues that we're concerned about. So first of all, we had to think very much about the integration of social, physical, and ecological dynamics, and think about what mechanisms are actually causing them, so a sort of systems view. Um, so we had, and then so in the project, we, had to, we actually did a lot of participatory work that was quite important in terms of engaging throughout the project with the Bangladeshi uh, uh, stakeholders in government. So we held workshops at least once a year, maybe more frequently than that, to, uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Then we had to look at what were the issues of physical and biological processes that really benefit people living in the delta in the rural environments. Actually think about quantifying these relationships and then bring it all together into an integrated framework and model to be able to explore possible futures. And we managed to do all those things. In a kind of pictorial sense, this picture here captures how we designed the project in that we have this aspect of governance analysis and stakeholder engagement at the top. It's long and thin because it ran through the project. That's, and we started with conceptual analysis because in many ways, the starting point, we weren't really sure um, about the relationship between ecosystem services and human well-being. So we did some qualitative work. This identified that seasons are very important, so it changed our sort of methodologies. We were going to do one household survey, we did three, um, um, three seasons to, to get to capture that, um, to capture that uh, dynamic. And then that sort of informed the socioeconomic data collection for the household survey, also a lot of biophysical modeling, I'll explain that in the next slide, which moved on and into an integration phase um, where we developed scenarios, and we also did uh, develop an integrated model, I'll explain that more as well in a moment, um, that was Delta DM, and then a, 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 this idea of policy analysis where we simulated um, the futures with that model, oops, didn't mean to do that, and we um, went back to the stakeholders, and so the stakeholders were helping us develop the scenarios, so that, that there was very much buy-in with developing the scenarios, and then taking results and actually discussing these results um, with uh, the stakeholders and actually what would they do if they, if they didn't like what they saw, what would they do? It's this idea of an iterative learning loop, which I'll mention again a little bit later. So what are the components that we considered? Well, they're sort of under three different areas. Um, we looked at governance analysis and the stakeholder engagement, and that's an ongoing process. We looked at social economic data collection and analysis. This included the household survey. Um, we, looked, we did analysis of the census to a statistical sort of model was built from that. We looked at population projections. We looked at ec economics, economic trends um, over the past uh, decade or two. And then we did a lot of biophysical work as well, um, sort of climate, I mean, this includes sea level, I mean, uh, um, both temperature and precipitation, um, CO2 as well, which is in the agricultural modeling. That then fed into the upstream basin uh, modeling. And each one of these boxes here represents essentially a model or a set of models that were sort of were coupled. 
um, and then a Bay of Bengal analysis. Um, and then this feeds down into analysis at the scale of the delta, um, looking at things like salinity, morphology, um, land use, and then into provisioning ecosystem services, agriculture, aquaculture, mangroves, and the fisheries. Um, and so this was all done in a sort of loosely coupled way, but then to really have our, see through our vision of prognosis, we needed to actually think about how we could join and link all these things together, because um, it's very ambitious just to do those three elements. And that, but then we wanted to have the fourth element of actually joining it together into a sort of truly sort of integrated framework, which is the uh, Delta DM. And I always say, is Delta DM, is this a piece of software um, that sort of describes coastal Bangladesh, or was actually a social device to get people with very different views to actually sit down and talk about their understanding and develop a shared understanding? And of course, it's both, because that's how it was produced. But it spends you know, an awful lot of time and energy uh, in doing that. So if we look at Delta DM in a little more detail, it's an interdisciplinary tool. It sort of covers a lot of different domains. It builds on the high fidelity models that have been used um, in the sort of in the biophysical work, things like Del3D, Ethicom. Um, but it's also taking secondary data. It's using the household survey, and it's taking the expert knowledge of people within the consortium and um, the stakeholders. What it actually corresponds to is it's really a meta model. It's a hybrid. It has a, it's some some aspects of it are lookup tables. Um, some aspects are. Uh, statistical emulators, which is why the word emulator appears in the title. And in other cases, we're actually running um, the code, for example, um, uh, the agricultural model. Uh, so, but it gives a fairly quick running time. It harmonizes scales and methods. It's fully coupled and it gives, so we have the feedbacks and it's giving us a, a quick running time. Who's actually participating in this? Again, the people involved is, I think is very important in this kind of process. So we've got our stakeholders, 50 plus agencies, We've got the households, the households we actually surveyed. We've got the specialist team with a wide range of different uh, skills. We've got the integrators. These are a subset of the Delta team, but they're the people that are actually thinking about the integration. And Attila Lassar is in the room, was actually led the integration um, in the project. And then lastly, we have the users. So that they're, and they're sort of taking, in terms of applying the model and taking it back um, to the stakeholders. And thinking about how we, these sort of link together. When we start building the model, we think about this long iteration route that sort of involves advice from the broad team and the knowledge that we've developed. But once we get a model that we feel represents um, the processes that are going on for the, for, for the questions we're asking, we can then think about a much shorter iteration where we don't need to go to the expert teams and we can just run Delta DM. And then we have to keep on asking the question, are we using the model within the domain where it's valid? And we have to remember, we might need to go back to that long iteration if we start to ask questions that are outside the box um, that, we've, uh, that, that we've actually sort of played with uh, up until that time. It takes a lot of different inputs to, um, in Delta DM, and I won't be supposed to read through all these, but you can just see them, but you know, there's a wide range of information, both you know, climate, various um, biophysical dimensions, the ecosystem services, the demography, et cetera. So taking a, both natural and social science um, inputs to be able to run the model. And these are you know, ex expressed from the, the, the outputs of the uh, more complex models or the, sort of, uh, the emulator, et cetera. And so we need scenarios to do that. Um, and then the main outputs, well, we actually output the hydrology is obviously fundamental to the sort of ecosystem services in the Delta. Sanalization, salt is fundamental um, to agricultural productivity, issues around livelihoods, and then an unusual, probably an unusual set of outputs that normally aren't output in the model, in the sense that you'd stop there and you'd hand your results over to another domain expert and they would do an interpretation. Well, this is all output within the model, so we have a lot of well-being and poverty and health indicators, both at the scale of the household, and obviously, then you can, if you have household outputs, you can then aggregate uh, up to regional um, outputs. Um, so things like income, relative welfare, et cetera. Things like Gini coefficient, which measures the inequality of, of, of income within um, a region. So aspects that were done within the model, I mean, we, we did things like um, the uh, sort of, um, we brought in biophysical emulation um, of these types of uh, aspects. Um, 
climate, hydrology, um, mangroves, etc. And then certain aspects were developed within the model, including like a salt balance, um, prop what was extended, um, and the emulation of the, uh, of the numerical models. The household component was built on the empirics of the household survey, um, and it's a sort of agent-based model where it considers 30 plus household archetypes. Um, there's only a small number of things people can do in Bangladesh with about seven or eight different livelihoods, but they can change what they do between seasons. So you get a large, um, you get a large, uh, a large possible range possibility space. Um, it looks at economic decisions and the poverty health indicators and outputs. Obviously, verification and validation are sort of uh, critical in looking for the bugs um, and also checking it against other data sets. And here are sort of some examples of validation. This is sort of comparing Epicom with uh, Delta DM for salinity, uh, for, that's for surface water salinity, for, um, for soil salinity, uh, and then um, for sort of crop uh, production. I'm sort of looking through these very fast, but just giving you a flavor here. And equally for the sort of uh, socio but some of the more social indicators, the black line shows the mean output from delta DM and the gray shows the spread, and then the circles are showing uh, different measures independent from uh, various surveys within Bangladesh. So we're looking at, um, here we're looking at sort of, uh, make sure I get up, the, the, the uh, total uh, expenditure in a family um, in A or um, down here, we're looking at the Gini coefficient. So again, they, again, reasonable uh, fits to observations. Um, and note that this is people living on less than $1.59 per day. So the numbers are falling both in the model and observed. So um, people are getting wealthy in the, in, the, in the Delta. That's an important thing to note. Our scenario framework was um, based on a sort of development scenarios, which were developed um, in a participatory way with stakeholders, and then climate scenarios. Um, so we had a sort of a three by three matrix. And we had this idea of an iterative learning loop whereby we start off with experts developing knowledge, um, stakeholders are developing um, the sort of scenarios at the uh, delta scale, then a qualitative to quantitative translation of the um, of the uh, information that was provided by the stakeholders, because often they're providing narratives really about, about where they are and where they, are the, where they might be in the future. This is then fed into Delta DM, producing output, taking that back in a form that can be understood by the stakeholders, and then, then a sort of a cycle of co-learning um, with the stakeholders. And um, the three scenarios I'm gonna show you are these, that sort of axis there from the uh, least sustainable uh, and uh, the, 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 the highest climate change up to the most sustainable and the least climate change, although they're all similar amounts of climate change. And two observations I just put in listening to some of the earlier talks that, you know, we found, you know, we often wanted to really engage with our stakeholders. Well, the workshop can only be one day. And so you've really got to spend your time very effectively and plan how you can do that. And the narratives are a sort of key communication device. They've been, that word's been mentioned uh, in other talks. But the narratives, I think, are very important. And that's how a lot of this exchange of information and knowledge goes, takes on, takes place. Scenario examples, um, again, a wide range of scenarios are sort of fed into the um, Delta DM model, just some summaries here. And I'll just illustrate a few of them here. So again, fisheries, this is an output of a model by Plymouth Marine Labs. And it's sort of showing that um, you know, fisheries are likely to fall. But the difference between, in the future, this is out to 2050, um, is largely a function of how you manage the fishery. If you manage the fishery in a sustainable way, you can sustain it, although you, there will be some decline, even if you, if you can follow good management practices. Demography. Well, population actually, you expect population to be rising. Population is either slowly falling or maybe falling quite a bit. I mean, so that this area is losing people. There's out-migration going on. Um, and economic scenarios, well, there's much more growth in the non-ecosystem service-based uh, aspects. That red line is showing that the, the um, we expect, based on observed trends, to see more, uh, more uh, percentage change um, in economic output in the, in the non-ecosystem uh, service parts of the economy. Just to show you a few illustrative results very, very quickly, um, this is flooding in 2050 at the end of the monsoon. 
Um, the polders were shown in some of the earlier talks. So, um, and so the areas here are flooding are outside um, the polders, very, very similar for all three um, scenarios. Um, and then we can actually even play around with the, the, the polder heights. We can look at the dikes, we can raise them, we can, uh, or we can lower them. Raising them makes no difference, so it's suggesting they're high enough, really, you're not going to get any benefit, at least with these water levels. This isn't a particularly extreme year. If you reduce them, clearly the flooding greatly increases. And then, but then obviously maybe that's what you do with tidal river management, but in a rather controlled way. This is just removing um, the uh, tide. Crop yields, this is sort of aggregated crop yields. The top line is showing over the, um, over the whole year. The bottom is showing in the dry season. Um, and so from the least sustainable to the more sustainable, you can see the colors are getting less red and orange. We're seeing higher productivity um, there. Um, with provisioning ecosystem services, we can aggregate the information. Um, and uh, you can see that, again, the least sustainable to the mo more sustainable. Um, this, is sort of, this is showing uh, social economy. Again, it's higher in this, on, in this side. Um, income is higher on this side. And then with the hazard-based ones, a lot more variability, maybe to expect from sort of wet, dry years, et cetera, storms, more variability or less, maybe less clear patterns there. The, 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 the livelihoods can also be unpicked. Um, um, and these are just sort of showing six out of the more than 30 archetypes, which is showing things, like, you know, showing different components, things like remittance is yellow, business is orange. These are just different types of ways people make their livelihoods. And ecosystem services are becoming less important with time. And you can actually even look at, there's a multi-dimensional poverty index, which Attila and uh, Helen Adams have in review at the moment, which shows um, different, uh, people, are, people are always poor, um, people who are getting richer, people that are going in and out of poverty, and people that stay poor. You can sort of see, again, see different typologies um, of, of people within the, within the system. Um, so just to sort of tie up then, and how does this relate to policy? Well, we had this stakeholder engagement, and so this is one of the events we held in the uh, planning commission in Bangladesh. And as we were doing the project, this Bangladesh Delta Plan came along. Um, which is funded by the government of the Netherlands and is taking a holistic, much more holistic view of the future of, of Bangladesh than has been done before. And our project, they made the comment, well, actually before this, nobody's really thought quite so holistically about Bangladesh as you are in the Esper Delta's project. So we sort of naturally um, found strong engagement and they facilitated a lot of our workshops, which really helped with stakeholder engagement. And there was even a final event um, which was looking at the Delta Plan and uh, our work. And they actually, um, from that, uh, have written to DFID, which is very su supporting us. And we're now actually starting a new project, which is um, going to be looking at applying this to assess selected projects within the Delta Plan. And it's a proof of concept. So using it in a policy manner rather than in a research manner to assess multiple indicators of these projects, including things like poverty, um, things that maybe wouldn't be assessed typically in a project appraisal. In terms of the kinds of things we can assess, and the, 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 it can be engineering, but it can also be subsidies, um, new channels, lots of different things can be assessed within the project. And within a small project, we're doing a side project called REACH, which is, we're looking at very different strategic policies for um, sort of flood management in, the Nether, in, in um, Bangladesh, uh, raising polders, uh, tidal river management we heard about earlier, um, or even retreat, just looking, again, what if kind of scenarios. So um, conclusion, last slide. So this work, I think, provides a new link model and data framework for thinking about the future of coastal Bangladesh. And you know, the Bangladeshis have commented that this is something they haven't seen before, and, and the people we're working with have engaged very strongly with the policy process as a result. They weren't working with government before we started working. I think it's a, as a modular approach that allows incremental improvements, which so, it, so it, can, it can progressively uh, change and be improved. Um, working with stakeholders was fundamental to the, to the um, success of the project so far, I think. We um, had regular workshops. People saw that we were taking note of what they said. It had local ownership. They felt it was their analysis, not or our analysis, not us as experts coming in um, and just imposing our view. 
The issue, there's clearly things, I mean, I'm very pleased we've got this, but the issue of understanding uncertainty and sensitivity of the coupled model is an ongoing process. All the individual components we understand, but when you start putting them together, clearly there are questions there, and we're learning as we go in terms of that. Um, three kind of key take-home messages. Um, what have we learned from all this, this huge effort? Well, the future up to 2050 is more influenced by human choice, policy interventions, and climate change. Now, Bangladesh tends to get written off, and people say, why should we even invest there? It's going to be gone. Why? Let's not bother. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot you can do in the next 30 years. You can build a very different and wealthier Bangladesh, which will be, more, will be, be, be much less vulnerable to climate change. But ecosystem services diminishes a proportion of the economy with time. That's continuing historic trends, but it's, you know, we try to really hit that because people don't like that conclusion, and uh, it doesn't go away. It seems to be a robust result. And significant poverty persists in some locations under all scenarios. So development is still going to be important. The natural economic growth you're seeing in, uh, in Bangladesh is not going to get the problem to go away. You need, you're going to still need focused development. And I suppose my last thought, so I think kind of engaging with the kind of policy questions I've shown you here, I think is a very, to my mind, is a very good way of forcing consideration of the human dimensions because you have to engage. If you're going to think about the sort of policy questions, you have to engage with human dimensions in some way, which depends on the question you're posing. Thank you very much. Well, I was hoping that we'd end uh, uh, a conference set of talks on the dynamic duel, and you did it fabulously. So thanks, Paul. So questions, questions. Yeah, Bob, it was a fascinating talk. Um, I guess I have one question coming from the human dimension side. And the way that the scenarios were used, I'm a little, I'd be interested in learning a little bit more, and I know there's only so much you can say now, said, but you had exogenous assumptions about population and overall economic growth. Did the models, how did they then translate that, like I noticed your $1.90 a day statistic? And I'm just curious, uh, were those things that were put in the scenarios or were those things somehow calculated in the models and any indication of how? The, um, the, demography, um, the demography and the um, and sort of some of the economic growth scenarios, they, they were scenarios because they had to be. I guess with this kind of problem, you always have to ask, where do you draw your boundaries? I mean, it would be lovely to have a model where, um, the, uh, where the demography was an emergent property of the model. And actually, y yesterday, Attila Lassar presented a poster on. Um, another project called DECMA where actually we're looking at human migration and there we're actually also going to have an economic model so maybe in the future we might you know again it's, it's not just we're not planning to do it at the moment but if we can fuse these two together we can have that um, demography the demography and the economics built in to it but they were scenarios in this analysis because that was all that, that was uh, yes because of resources we had to decide what was feasible. Other questions? Okay, I'd like to ask also, in um, as your um, as your scenarios are for, are kind of projecting towards increased independence from vulnerable ecosystem services, and energy is a key part of that. How explicitly did you model the um, transition of the energy infrastructure, or was that just implicit in your economic model? That was implicit. I mean, yeah, we didn't. We, I mean, that would again. That's another thing that we'd like to do. I mean, this is uh, uh, we're working. Um, in Southampton with other groups who are doing work on infrastructure systems and um, looking to the future, it would not be nice to see a um, merging of those two efforts to sort of bring those in. Um, one of the, act actually in, in the context of Bangladesh, one of the biggest aspects of, or the, lo the low hanging fruit of infrastructure would be bridges and transport networks because the work on the census demonstrated that access was a big factor driving poverty in, along the Padma. So building, so, so actually just improving those transport networks would have a, again, it's also, it would be a fairly simple, and in fact, and they are building bridges, obviously, as you're well aware, but I mean, that this would strongly support that, that that deserves more effort.
No, we have a break now. After